Hey guys, I'm LT. And I'm Dan. And welcome to BHK Outdoors, your beacon for all things outdoors. So grab a cup of coffee. Or chugga. And for the next 30 minutes, let's get out there. If you have any questions or show ideas for Dan and I, you can email us at radio at bhkoutdoors.com. That is radio at bhkoutdoors.com. Mikey, are you yawning? We're trying to do a radio show over here. So today's program is brought to you by Blind Horse Knives. Blind Horse Knives, American-made knives made right here in Ohio by Dan and myself and all the fine folks that work for us. Check it out at www.blindhorseknives.com. That is www.blindhorseknives.com. Dan, I think today one of the things we wanted to talk to people about is um, we, we did that little show on training and different things and or practicing and the importance of it. You being an avid deer hunter, uh, we wanted to really talk to the folks and, and those hunters out there about bows today. Absolutely. I mean, bows are the way that I like to hunt. I mean, period, hands down. I think if you are a bow hunter, you are as close to nature as you're ever going to get. And you have a certain connection spiritually, I believe, if you are a bow hunter. Mm -hmm. Um, Because if you're bow hunting, the yardage difference uh, where you can take that animal, it's critical. You're within 20 yards most cases. Uh, There are guys that will shoot further than that, but I can tell you, I've only ever shot one deer with a bow that was over 20 yards, mm-hmm. and I've killed quite a pile of them in my life. When you say the yardage differences, just as an example, I know Ohio is a shotgun state. What would be an like a, an average or maybe even a long distance for you to take a shotgun sh- shotgun? shot? Shotgun? Uh, I think you're pushing it if you're 100 yards. I mean, okay. there are some shotguns that'll shoot well past 100 yards, but... You know that you're you're all jacked up when you're shooting. If you're in a, a have to hurry up situation shooting, and it's not probably an ethical shot at that mm-hmm. point. Um, I see deer all the time from shotgun wounds where their legs are shot up and things like that, where people are shooting at them as they're running and that kind of thing, and it busts them up quite a good quite mm-hmm. a good bit. Hey, um, w- when we're talking about bows, I know there's been, I mean, bows almost as old as a knife, probably, you know, as far as been around forever. Um, I know just from my experience, I do have a long bow, so I shoot a long bow. What do you like, um, let's say, and in, in, I don't really want to use the word primitive, but, you know, the not new bows, because I, I want to get to them in a minute, but let's say the long bows and the recurves. Can you give me some insight on, because I know you've, sh- you've shot both. I think you probably own both, so. Yeah, the first bow I think that I ever used was a recurve bow. Um, and I I learned how to actually shoot archery from a guy named Fred Bear. And it wasn't that he taught me personally. It's just that I uh, saw a book or something with Fred Bear in it talking about bow hunting. And that's where my interest came into bow hunting. And I thought, well, this is something that I would love to do is to shoot a bow and be like Fred Bear. Um, so that's where my beginning came. And the, the difference between a recurve and a long bow, so to speak, would be the different shape of the limb. Um, I think you get more speed, I think, out of a recurve bow because of the shape. And the limbs are straighter on a long bow, which is more primitive. And the choice really is up to the shooter of what what they want to accomplish in their hunting. Um, that's why a lot of guys will go all the way back and get as primitive as they can. Some guys are even using stone broadheads. So uh, mm-hmm. it's just what you're looking for, I guess, in in your choice. When, when you're talking about the longbow and the recurve, yardage is different, I guess, between the more modern compounds or the crossbow. There's probably a... Is it broad there, too, in your yardage differences? Yeah. Um, like I said, it all depends on how proficient you are with whatever weapon you're using. You should never shoot beyond what your capabilities are. If you can shoot well at 30 yards, then you can take ethical shots at 30 yards. There's guys out there, depending on what the game is, that they'll shoot 60, 70 yards. Um, but to me, I don't think that's real ethical for most people to be able to do that. Right. I mean, I'm talking about professionals that shoot probably every day. How important is the actual bowstring to a recurve and, or, and a longbow? 
Yeah, Technology is changing all the time. I mean, they have different uh, kinds of bow strings and things like that that perform better. I mean, it's it's all over the place now. I mean, you can get so many different things. It's it's actually crazy. It's hard to keep up with it all. Now, I know finger placement versus um, releases and all that kind of stuff. Can you tell the guys a little bit like the difference? And also knocking. You know, I know the single knock, double knock, above the knock, below the knock. Kind well, of. Well, it's just finger placement. Whether okay. you're shooting one finger above, one below, two below, um, three fingers below. Whether you're using a release aid, there's there's so many different ways to do this. There's calf hair, um, leather things. There's gloves. There's just a lot of different choices, and you need to pick the one that you're most comfortable with. I always used to shoot a glove, um, just because the the calf hair was used more for like competition and it would slip more than the leather glove. Um, so it would give you a little bit better release. When you say glove, you mean like the fingertips or yeah, a actual leather, a glove? Yeah, leather glove. Okay. That's pretty interesting. Now I know also on the strings, a lot of times you see those silencers and stuff. Do those really work? Uh, yeah, you should have something because what you're dealing with and the reason you put a silencer on there in the first place is the deer are going to hear the noise. The time it takes for sound to travel um, to a deer's ear, um, that's a lot faster than the actual arrow could make it there. So the deer actually hear the noise and respond to the noise and do what's called the string jump before the arrow gets there. So to silence the string and making that uh, reflex noise be a little less is why we run silencers on the string. Is there a... I mean, they're, they're probably different ones are made differently. Oh, yeah. There's there's all kinds. they got yarn. You can put simple yarn around a string, and it'll oh, give it some that. deadening. Um, they have rubber, what they call cat whiskers. I mean, they have these little rubber knobs. Uh, if you're shooting like a recurve, the old bear bows, you used to put a little rubber uh, stop up on the top of the string so that when the string released, the string wouldn't slap the bow limbs it would hit that little rubber and give it a little cushion so you didn't have that twang. Well, what do you personally prefer when you're looking at for silencers for your like long bows and recurves? What do you like? Um, I used to go traditional, and I, I always went with cat whiskers. Um, you know, again, that's personal preference. I found that at 20 yards, they work just fine for me. Um, but again, I think that's a yardage thing. Uh, I like to be within 20 yards because I don't think the deer can string jump as much i mean they're going to string jump so a lot of times you're just going to calculate that are they going to do it or not you know what i mean um so you sometimes you're just waiting to see how the deer is going to react how jumpy it is before you even shoot right and then, and then you shoot <laughs> i'm going to ask you this question because mike had that dumb look on his face <laughs> he's, he's i know he's wanting to ask you what cat whiskers are Cat whiskers are just little pieces of rubber band that when you stretch them, they'll come apart and there'll be many, many little whisker looking things. They look like cat whiskers. Now, Mikey, does that make more sense to you now? There, see that? He's happy. Yeah, he's happy now. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's pretty cool. So the, the, so you, there's methods of silencing, you, glove, no glove. So this is a lot of your personal thing, right? I mean, that's... Yeah, it goes into your preparation. Um you know, we were talking the other day about practice with your equipment. And this is one of the things that you really need to do to know where it needs silenced or what your problems are. You have to think of your hunting situation and you have to go through it mentally in your in your head so that any problems that are going to arise, you've already addressed them before they became a problem. I always tell people when you're deer hunting, the the game is who's going to make the mistakes. You or the deer. And the one that makes the fewest mistakes gets the prize. Now that makes a lot of sense. You know? Yeah, it does. That makes a, a lot of sense. I never really looked at it that way, but that, that uh, does It's absolutely a up. game of mistakes. I've made mistakes on deer where the arrow would hit against the riser and make a noise. Mm -hmm. And that cost me a deer. So now I put... Uh, you know, different products on there to silence it. You can buy all kinds of adhesives that will uh, adhere to that, that have a cloth or a mole hair or whatever on there that, so when the arrow hits it, it doesn't make a metallic noise. 
Yeah. Um, so you're all, you're you're just looking for okay, how am I going to make a mistake? Because you know you're going to screw up. Everybody does, right. and whoever screws up the least amount of times, the the deer or you is the one's going to win. I might have to have you look at my longbow after this and see if I have it set up right. <laughs> well, you got to so. look at it yourself. That's that's the whole idea here. Is that is that you've got to be comfortable with your equipment and you've got to sit there and practice your draw. You've got to go through all the scenarios in your head of where this deer is going to come from, whether it's coming from behind you to your right side, to your left side. You've got to be able to draw. You've got to be able to get in position. So, you know, when I'm thinking about my setup in the woods, I'm always facing my stand the way that I think the deer might come, mm -hmm. but I'm always prepared for them to come in the position that I don't expect because if there's one thing you can count on from a white-tailed deer is to never be able to count on what they do. Uh, again, makes a lot of sense, some good insight. So we, we've talked about the longbow, we've talked about the recurve, and then a number of years ago, here comes the compound bow. When that first uh, was something that you had an option at uh, in your younger days, I mean, were you jumping right on that? I absolutely jumped right on it. And one of the reasons why I jumped right on it was the arrow speed was increased significantly. And now I think the bows now shoot a lot faster. I think they're over 300 feet per second. So, I mean, you're talking pretty quick bows. Right. But so, e even at that 300 feet per second, sound travels a lot faster than that. So you still have to do the same things with that that you did have to with all the primitive stuff. I do remember when the compounds came out, I mean, to me, the biggest advantage was the release of the drawer. What do you call that when it pulled? Release aid? Well, no, when it came back and... Oh, the let off. The let off. Yeah, you're talking about the My let gosh, off. that sure did change things right there. Well, yeah, because you could shoot a 70-pound bow and only hold about 30. Mm -hmm. yeah, me and my buddy were in the woods one time. And a spike horn ran up to us, and this was this is back in the 70s, so we were both new at this bow hunting thing, and the deer surprised us so much. We both drew at the same time, we're going to shoot it, and the deer, we were waiting for it to turn broadside, so as we drew, we were holding that bow back for a long time, and I look over at my buddy waiting for this deer to turn sideways so we could shoot, and he was shaking from side to side by holding the string because we're <laughs> you know we're holding 60 pounds right and it was just comical as all get out because i watched him just shaking his arm was moving back and forth three inches from side to side he was shaking so bad and then i started to shake and we ended up not shooting the deer had to <laughs> let down because we were both laughing so hard at each other shaking oh, but my. you can't hold the bow and that's one of the 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 things with the compound bow is that when you could hold it you know, you could hold the shot a lot longer before you released. Right. So when, let's say you, ha you had that compound and that changed things because, like you said, you had to let off. You could probably even go up in poundages then too, right? Because Absolutely. Of, because of that. Um, yeah, I actually, this is not too smart, I don't think, but I actually, one time with my compound, because I was a hunter and I had bought a bow and the, the compound bow was a 90-pound bow. So cranked all the way up, this thing was shooting, I think, 92 pounds. And I actually shot in competition with this bow at 92 pounds. Mm. My theory behind that was I was not shooting the competition for the competition. I was shooting it to hone my skills. Right. So I wanted to get very used to drawing this bow. And I would never like put my bow up in the air. Uh, pointed toward the sky and a lot of people will point their bow toward the sky and draw and then level the bow out to shoot which i think is way too much movement on a white-tailed deer right so i would practice even with that 90 pound draw weight i would practice on pushing the bow straight away as i drew the the arrow back and uh you know so that's one of the things that i practice a lot was how much movement in the draw yeah, it makes a lot of sense, uh, and I definitely want to touch on practicing here in just a little bit. Um, I'll tell you what, guys. Mike said we need to have a commercial break, so we're going to be right back with you in just about one minute. So stand by. We we're talking about bows and hunting this this show. Thank you. Beard, long hair, and tattoo. Hey guys, I'm LT. And I'm Dan. And we're with Self Reliance Illustrated. Um, dot com. Well, I wasn't going to say dot com right there. Oh, I was just going to announce. Okay. You can check the magazine out at selfreliancillustrated.com. 
Come on, you gotta have something. I can't do well, the whole commercial. What are you doing? You're just it's sitting self- over there telling me like, it's okay, self- go. You have thirty seconds. To I got tell thirty them about seconds. The hey, go to selfrelianceillustrated.com. It's awesome. It's cool. You're gonna learn how to start fires and water stuff and everything. Hey guys, I'm LT. And I'm Dan. And we're with Blind Horse Knives. You can check our knives out at www.blindhorseknives.com. Hey Dan, why don't you sing the website for them? Sing it? Sing it. www.blindhorseknives.com Man, if that does <laughs> www.blindhorseknives.com Okay, and if he was to sing it in key, would it make you go look at the website? Blindhorseknives.com, guys. Thanks for listening. Yeah, listening. Hey guys, welcome back. It's LT and Dan. When today we're talking about archery, uh, some of the ins and outs, and and some of the things that Dan has done over the years. And uh, we left off talking to you a little bit about the compound bow and such. Dan, let's let's. I want to know kind of uh, compound versus crossbow, okay? Because that's kind of uh, Ohio. Uh, where I hunt in West Virginia, I can't use a crossbow. Ohio is a whole different state and idea behind that. And um, why would you consider a crossbow over the other types of bows? Um, it's Again, it's a personal preference, what you want to do. Um, I think some of the record books, they wouldn't recognize um, that you were taking one with a crossbow. There wasn't really a category. I'm not sure if they've changed that yet, but there wasn't a category. So if you wanted to shoot a Pope and Young a buck, then you had to have a certain type of a bow or a certain poundage. I mean, you had to look at what you were trying to accomplish. Um, personally, for me, living in Vermont all those years, we weren't allowed to use crossbows. You had to have some type of an injury or something that would limit your ability to pull a bow. And, uh, and you had to have a doctor's permit to be able to use one. But when I moved to Ohio, um, I found out that you could use one, and I said, "Wow, this is great! I got to try this." Mm-hmm. And I fell in love with the with the crossbow. Um, one of the things I like the most about the crossbow is it's more like the rifle. I mean, I even have my crossbow has a scope on it, and that thing is extremely deadly. I mean, this thing will really drive attack. Is this another step up in poundage over of uh, over like a compound? Oh, it is. Yeah, there's a big significant jump. I mean, instead of shooting, you know, 80, 90 pounds, whatever, you'd be shooting with a, a compound. You're now talking about 175 pounds or, or even more in some cases. Well, would that allow you or or do you even consider shooting farther distances that you would with a compound? You or can research? shoot further. Okay. But again, uh, to me, that's never been the way to go for me. I like, when I'm hunting, I like to be close and personal with the animals. So most of the deer that I shoot are within 20 yards. And when I say within 20 yards, I'm talking probably realistically about 15 yards. Okay. I mean, I like getting close. It's a it's a more personal thing to me to see how close I can get. Hmm. Hey, well, as far as the bows are concerned, each one of them probably have a, a different arrow that is best suited for that particular thing. Tell me a little bit about broadhead and arrow selection. And, and, and I know there's something about, with the length of the arrow, with your draw and all that. Those all come into play, right? I mean, you don't want an arrow that's too short, Absolutely. too long. You have to, you have to get your bow tuned. So if you're shooting a bow, you, ha- you have to take it to a professional and, and they'll tell you what you need to be shooting because they'll measure your draw length they'll figure in the poundage of the bow Mm -hmm. and then they have to match the spine weight of the arrow which means how much that arrow is going to flex when you shoot it so that the arrow doesn't snap in half and it recovers and flies straight because there's a lot of bending that happens in an arrow no matter whether it's wood or aluminum so the the arrow has to absolutely be matched and the length it makes a big difference. I mean, if you're if I shoot an arrow that's four inches longer than you, then I have to take that into consideration of how much that's going to flex more than the arrow that you're shooting. Because the shorter the arrow, the less it flex hmm. will flex. So it has to be matched up to your bow and to your, your draw length. That's quite interesting. So uh, as far as arrows go, then um, what about your broadheads, field points? I mean, do you even practice with field points? Or I don't practice anymore with okay. field points. The I used to because I would shoot hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of arrows, and I would do that like all week long. I When I used to practice in my younger days, uh, I practiced every single day. 
I mean, there was not a day that went by. I'd shoot I'd shoot one arrow before I went to work in the morning. And the reason like I wanted to shoot one arrow was because when I shot one arrow, that represented my first time in the tree stand and I was going to shoot one arrow. That one had to count. You don't get warm-ups before you go hunting a lot of times. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes when you're going out in the morning, you're going out there before, before daylight. So you're not going to get a practice shot in. You're going to just shoot, you know, when you, you get on a deer. So you've got to be able to shoot when your muscles are cold. And I would do the same thing at night. I would always shoot one before I went to bed. And if I could, I would shoot, you know, many in the evening if it allowed um so definitely you have to practice those situations that's pretty nice what about uh we've talked about bows we've talked about the arrows um and let's talk to, we talked about the difference in points but broadhead i know they have two blade three blade four blade uh, yeah they got mechanicals and all that yeah. kind of, now kind for, of break that down for us and, and then get, I, I really want to know what you use and why you use that I'm kind of old school. Now, I I like to have my broadhead be as strong as it absolutely can. And I have had extremely good luck with what's called the Thunderhead 125. Now, there's different schools of thought. A lot of people will shoot 100 grain broadhead, and some people are shooting 125 grains. I always choose 125 grains over the 100 grains. There's not much difference in the cutting diameter. Um, but the reason that I go with the weight, um, I like the kinetic energy. You know, a lot of guys will talk speed, 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 but for me, the kinetic energy has made more of a difference in me taking the big bucks. Um, cause I like the, the amount of force that is generated from the weight. And once you get that weight moving, it penetrates a lot deeper i think when it hits it hits harder Mm -hmm. so and to me i do not like the mechanical blades i don't care what they say there's there's stuff out there that they're saying is all the rage i think rage is one of the broadheads but to me yeah they're they're good but i've also heard horror stories where they don't work well in certain situations or something will go wrong for me when i'm fine-tuning my equipment I have to look at everything, and it goes back to that, who's going to make the mistake? I don't want to make a mistake on the biggest buck I ever see. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I usually hunt the biggest buck that is in my area, and that's the one that I'm after. And that's usually the one that I get. But, you know, I don't want to take that last moment and have it come down to, is my broadhead going to fail? So I go with something that absolutely works. And a Thunderhead 125, now I've shot that through a steel barrel. I've taken a 55-gallon steel uh, barrel and shot that broadhead through it, and it did not come apart. I've shot it through plywood. I've done all these different tests myself, and the broadhead has never come apart. I've put that thing, when I had a deer string jump on me, I stuck that thing into the backbone of a deer, and it didn't damage any of it. I mean, if you can think of a broadhead, you know, penetrating solid bone and it doesn't come apart, to me, that's a good thing to have. How many blades are on that? There's three on the one that I shoot. Is is the number of blades, does that, is that important? Um, it is. The more cutting surfaces you have, the, the more chance you have of hitting an artery. Okay. Um, so, I mean, that's all, all that stuff is important. But again, you should never rely on just that. It's always about the shot placement and how well you can shoot your equipment. Right. Makes a lot of sense. Hey, um, as far as quivers go, okay, that's kind of how we get our equipment to where we get it kind of thing. I know that you can, I've seen them for backs. I've seen people have them on their hip. They attach them to the bows. What's some of the advantage, disadvantage, reasons why you would use this over that kind of idea? I use a detachable quiver on all of my stuff because I do not want that quiver on my bow. The reason that I don't want that on my bow is it's another chance for a mistake. Remember I told you earlier about the mistakes. Mm -hmm. There's one more chance for that thing to rattle. There's one more chance for that arrow to fall out of there. There's one more, there's so many different things that can go wrong with having that quiver attached to your bow, you know? So what, what I look at is, is I want my quiver to be detachable and I have a little device that I take with me that I hang my quiver in the tree next to me. 
so that if I need a second arrow, I just have to reach over and pull one off of the quiver. But I don't have it on me because it's it's just one more chance for me to knock that the end of the arrow sticking out into my tree stand or a limb or something and have it fall to the ground. I've made all these mistakes when I was younger, so mm-hmm. I just try not to make these mistakes. So um, you basically carry it in the woods on your bow and then detach it. That's that's the way you get it there? Those, yes, it's on your or, bow carrying it? or okay. I detach it before I go in and I put it in my backpack. Okay, sounds pretty cool. Okay, guys, we're going to take a short commercial break, and we're going to be right back, and uh, we're gonna, Dan's going to tell you a little bit about how to train year-round. So we'll be right back. Stick with us. Hey, guys, I'm LT. And I'm Dan. Hey, Dan, Mike said we had to do a commercial. We did? Yep. What do you want to do it on? Um, knives. Okay. Hey, guys, check out www.blindhorseknives.com. Dan and I own the company, and we sure do like talking to you about our knives, don't we, Dan? Yes, we do. Mikey, is that good enough? No. No? No. What did he say, like 10 seconds to kill? No. All right, www.blindhorseknives.com. We'll see you there. Hey, guys, we're back, and we're talking about archery today. And, uh, Dan, one of the last things before we go for the day, how do you train year-round? Should you train year-round? How often should you shoot? Kind of give us your insight on your personal over the years. You've been archery hunting for a number, number of years. You've taken quite a lot of big bucks with archery. Uh, give the guys an insight on how to train, how to stay up on it, and what, what kind of things you do. Well, some of the things that I do is I, I never lose the muscle memory that it takes to make your shot. To me, practicing the shot or the the steps that lead up to the shot are more important than the actual shot. I mean, you can you can practice with your bow sitting in your living room. And I used to practice watching a deer show on TV or a hunting show. And I would take my bow and I would draw it and I would hold the pin onto the target and then I would pretend that I shot and then I would let the bow down Um, and I would do that over and over again I would try to draw that bow without making any movement other than the actual movement it takes to draw the bow that means no left or right no up or down movement just straight back to your lip and just practice that draw and then I would practice my breathing so that it's kind of like shooting a gun when you would, you know, inhale or whether you're going inhaling or exhaling to stop your breath at that moment that you're going to make that shot so that your release is smooth. And, you know, that's what I'm I'm talking about when you, you do these things is you've got to practice and practice and practice. So I do a lot of it while I'm just watching TV. Yep. So um the other thing that I also do is is I make a lot of different ways to practice. Some of the fun ways that I would practice is is get up on top of the garage roof or something like that where I was elevated about the height of my stand or actually set up my stand in my yard and practice out of it. Um, and then I would throw golf balls out on the lawn and I would try to shoot these golf balls. And what that does is you don't know the yardage, so you have to make these guesses. So important thing to remember is you're not going to know the yardage, so to speak, in the woods. You're going to have to make an educated guess on how you're shooting. So come up with a lot of fun games that you can do. I used to shoot uh, ping pong balls hovered off of a vacuum cleaner, reverse the flow, and shoot ping pong balls out of midair. I mean, I've shot aspirins. Um, Just anything that you can think of that makes your shooting fun. Sounds like a great... Uh, opportunity. Hey, thanks for the insight on archery. Always glad to talk about hunting and stuff. So uh, thank you very much for that, buddy. Hey, no problem. Hey, for the very latest, be sure to like our BHK Outdoors Facebook page, or you can follow us on Twitter. If you have any questions or show ideas for Dan and I, you can email us at radio at bhkoutdoors.com. Thank you all for being with us today. Remember to join us right here next Saturday morning for BHK Outdoors, your beacon for all things outdoors. Thanks to our producer, Mike Henniger. And until then, I'm LT. And I'm Dan. And may God bless all of you.